Hello, I wanted to make a video about the audio taper potentiometer. It's a mechanical device we are familiar with in audio equipment as the volume control. It's also called a logarithmic potentiometer. We will see that it does not have a logarithmic taper at all, but actually has an exponential taper. Our ears interpret sound in logarithmic fashion, so the volume control must have the inverse of the logarithm, which is exponential. We will look at the laws of psychophysics to help understand how our senses work. We will also see an application where it's sometimes better to use a linear taper potentiometer for audio. A potentiometer is just an adjustable resistive divider. For those not familiar with the basic electronics theory of a voltage divider, I'll quickly review it and derive the voltage divider equation. The voltage divider can be any number of resistors across an electric potential. Shown here in its simplest case, the potential is from the input voltage Vn and ground. From Ohm's law, the voltage across R1 is the current I times the resistance of R1. The voltage across R2 is the current I times the resistance of R2. The input voltage is the sum of those voltages, and V out is the voltage across R2. We can then write the equation in terms of V out over V in as IR2 over IR1 plus IR2. The I's fall out and we were left with R2 over R1 plus R2. This is the fundamental voltage divider equation. This assumes there is no load on V out. Instead of two discrete resistors, a potentiometer is a single piece of resistor material that a mechanical wiper moves across. Here's a typical operation of a volume control having an audio signal source applied through the potentiometer to the load. The wiper is moved to vary the output. It must feed into subsequent circuitry, so there's always a load, but it's usually high impedance, so the effect of the load is negligible. Near the end of this video, we will look at an application where the load is not negligible. It's routinely called a pot for short. Here is a rotary potentiometer. It has three terminals. The wiper is the center terminal, the left terminal is connected to the wiper when it's adjusted to the far counterclockwise extent of its rotation. And the rightmost terminal is connected to the wiper when adjusted to the maximum clockwise extent of rotation. Let's take a peek inside the bottom side. The substrate of the pot is often a wafer made of phenolic material, but sometimes ceramic. It has a resistive material track that the wiper slides across. It's often applied through a silkscreen process. The resistive material can be a carbon composition, conductive plastic, CERMET, which is an abbreviation for the aggregate of ceramic and metals. They are also made with wire-wound elements, but are not used for small signal audio applications. It has a metallic wiper that conducts from the center wiper terminal to the resistive track here at the maximum counterclockwise position. Note that we are looking at the bottom side of the pot, so the maximum counterclockwise position is on the right. Now the wiper is being turned to the maximum clockwise position. The rotational angle for the majority of rotary pots is 300 degrees. Small dimples are formed into the back cover of the pot. A rectangular feature like this is made as part of the rotary to strike against the dimples in the cover to limit rotation. Potentiometers are available in more than just rotary types. The slide potentiometer has the same basic internal features as rotary types, except everything works in line. Let's take a look at the electrical action of a linear potentiometer. As an example, we will consider a resistance of 10,000 ohms. It's now turned to its maximum counterclockwise extent, which I'm calling position zero. The resistance between the wiper and the max counterclockwise position is near zero ohms. You should read the full 10K from the wiper to the max clockwise terminal. 
turning the wiper to the mid position, which I'm calling 5, should read 5K from the wiper to the max counterclockwise terminal, and 5K from the wiper to the max clockwise terminal. Turning it up to 10, you should read near 0 ohms from the wiper to the max clockwise terminal, and 10K from the wiper to the max counterclockwise terminal. Let's now take a look at the electrical action of an audio potentiometer, also having a resistance of 10,000 ohms. At position 0, the resistance between the wiper and the max counterclockwise is near 0 ohms. You should read the full 10K from the wiper to the max clockwise terminal. Turning the wiper to the mid position, we should read something like 800 ohms from the wiper to the max counterclockwise terminal. Then the remainder of the 10,000 ohms from the wiper to the max clockwise terminal. Again, turning it up to 10, you should read near 0 ohms from the wiper to the max clockwise terminal and 10K from the wiper to the max counterclockwise terminal. It's clear that with the audio taper pot, the resistance varies gradually as it increases with clockwise rotation. Before we look at the full taper characteristics, of an audio taper pot, let's look at the way our ears are sensitive to sound pressure levels. Weber's law is defined as the minimum increase of stimulus which will produce a perceptible increase of sensation is proportional to the pre-existent stimulus. Here's a square of 10 dots randomly spaced within. Here's the same square with 20 dots. It's visually apparent there are double the amount of dots. Here's the square with 110 dots. Let's add 10 dots to that. It's hard to see much of any change. I'll go ahead and color over those dots that were added. This human perception includes stimuli to all senses. Vision, hearing, taste, touch, and smell. Ernest Heinrich Weber was one of the first people to approach the study of the human response to a physical stimulus in a quantitative fashion. The term psychophysics was coined to describe the interdisciplinary study of how humans perceive physical magnitudes. This is Weber's law, where ds is the just noticeable difference, s is the reference stimulus, and k is a constant. It basically states that the rate of change of a perceived stimulus over the existence stimulus is constant. Here's an example for sensing weight. Let's say we are holding a 10 kilogram weight. We can perceive an increase of 0.2 kilograms. So K is 0.02. This is the just noticeable difference. We can use this factor and Weber's law to predict the just noticeable difference when holding a 50 kilogram weight, which would be around 1 kilogram. Let's consider a sound example. This is a graph of background intensity versus a noticeable difference in intensity. In a quiet room, we can easily perceive the human voice whispering, but at a loud rock concert, the person would need to yell at the top of their lungs to be heard. Weber's law is just a rule of thumb. It fails at low intensities and fails at high intensities. Gustav Fechner was a student of Weber, although Weber's law includes a statement of proportionality of a perceived change to an initial stimuli, Weber only refers to this as a rule of thumb regarding human perception. It was Fechner who formulated this statement as a mathematical expression he referred to as Weber contrast, where dp is the rate of change of perception and k is a measurement constant. Fechner noticed in his own studies that different individuals have different sensitivities to certain stimuli. For example, the ability to perceive differences in light intensity could be related to how good the individual's vision is. He also noted that the human sensitivity to stimuli changes depends on which sense is affected. Fechner derived his law from the Weber contrast. Let's go ahead and derive it by integrating Weber's contrast. We can see it's in the form of dx over x. 
which is the same as 1 over x, the integral is the natural log of the absolute value of x. Integrating gives us p equals k times the natural log of s plus the constant of integration c. We will set p equal to 0 as the minimum perception and rearrange to solve for c and make the associated stimulus s sub 0 being the minimum detectable stimulus. Then put c back into the equation. Now we have the difference between the log of two numbers. We can apply the logarithm quotient rule, and voila, Fechner's law is derived. The key is that the perception is a natural logarithmic function of the ratio of a perceived stimulus over a minimum detectable stimulus. Being based on Weber's law, it fails at low intensities and fails at high intensities. It's basically a rule of thumb. With the stimulus of sound, it gets even more complicated. Enter the Fletcher Munson Equal Loudness Contour. An equal loudness contour is a measure of sound pressure level over the frequency spectrum for which a listener perceives a constant loudness when presented with pure steady tones. Imagine listening to mid range sounds from a television in your living room at a sound pressure level of 60 dB SPL. A bass note down at 60 Hz would need to be around 15 dB higher in sound pressure level to be perceived as the same loudness at 1 kHz. The audio taper pot does not take any of this into account. You may have seen some audio equipment with a loudness switch. When turned to the on position, it adds extra bass and treble to the low intensity sounds to make it sound more normal. Here's a plot of the natural log function. To compensate for our logarithmic hearing, the audio taper should be made to have the inverse log or exponential taper. You can see its inverse, e to the n, is mirrored across the linear line. The limit near zero of the natural logarithm of x when x approaches zero is minus infinity. And the limit near minus infinity of the e to the x function when x approaches minus infinity is zero. Let's move forward and look at some measured data on various audio taper pots. I threw together a contraption for measuring the resistance of rotary pots capable of adjusting the shaft rotation in one degree increments. However, I chose not to make the measurements to such a small resolution. Here's the measurements of a Stumac 500K pot. It's the resistance between the max counterclockwise terminal and the wiper over the 300 degree span of rotation. I attempted to construct an exponential trend line to match the data. It's obvious that constructing a resistance track with a continuously varying resistivity would be quite onerous. It's apparent by looking at the data these pots have two to three piecewise linear sections. Also, with every pot I measured, the resistance flattens out near the max clockwise area. On a numbered dial, there is little difference between the resistance between 9 and 10. Here's a chart of all the measurements I made. The resistance measurements are normalized to 100% of the pot's total resistances, since I wanted to show various pot values on the same chart for comparison. The first measurement is on an alpha 500k pot. It has a sharp break at 180 degrees, and it's clear to see there are two piecewise linear segments in the resistance track. Next is a CTS 250K. Notice it has a very gradual change between the two linear segments. Next is a CGE brand 100K made in Mexico. It has three distinct piecewise linear sections. Finally, a Stumac 500K, it appears to have two distinct linear sections. So overall, there's not a big difference in their shapes. When are audio taper potentiometers not the best? It's when there is a considerable load on the wiper of the pot. As an example, guitar volume controls often have various loads. It sharpens the fall off when turned counterclockwise 
from the max clockwise position. Guitar volume controls are usually run at or near max clockwise, unlike radio or TV. Radio or TV would rarely be operated at full volume. The possible guitar loads span the large range. Here's a chart I put together with input resistances and capacitances for various amplifiers and effects. Most tube type amplifiers have a very high input impedance ranging from around 500k and up. A typical effects pedal is around 500k. One of the lowest I found was 80s model PV solid state amplifiers having an input resistance of 231k. Having even a moderate load resistance on the wiper of a pot can have a profound effect on the effective resultant taper of the system. Let's make a function that calculates the voltage division ratio for the specific load resistance. Recall the voltage divider equation from earlier with two discrete resistors R1 and R2. We will reconstruct that with a potentiometer having a total resistance RT. We will model that with two independent variable resistors and make RBWL the parallel combination of RB and the load resistance RL which is RB times RL over RB plus RL. We will put that in the voltage divider equation. Since RA changes with the taper, we can state that RA equals the total resistance RT minus RB and substitute that in the place of RA. Now let's simplify. Multiply top and bottom by RB plus RL. Join these three terms using the common denominator of RB plus RL, distribute RT and RB, adding the terms gives us this, then the RB RL terms cancel. Now let's bring the RB plus RL term back into the equation. The RB plus RL terms cancel. And finally, we have our equation to plot voltage attenuation of a pot with a specific load resistor. Bear in mind this is a first order approximation applicable to low and mid frequencies. Load and coupling capacitances will vary volume at very low and very high frequencies. I'm just sticking with resistance to keep it simple to show the point of how it affects potentiometer taper. Here's the 500k pot with no load. Check out how the taper changes with a 220k load. And here's a one bag pot with no load and with a 220k load. The roll off is very steep. A linear taper pot could be used instead. Here's a 500k linear function. Having a 220k load turns the linear pot into somewhat of an exponential taper. Here's a one meg with a 220k load. The response looks a lot like audio taper pot characteristics, so having a load on a linear pot can turn it into a subtle audio taper pot. Thanks for watching. Please click the like, subscribe, and notification bell so you don't miss any upcoming content.